Good morning, everybody. This is Jim Ransom with another edition of Morning Jim Poetry. December 16th is the day. And our theme for the midwinter, mid December at least, program is da 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 da, winter. <laughs> this theme can evoke all sorts of memories and poetic reactions, and we can only touch on it. We can only touch on a few of these. So let's start <clears throat> with the one that we've all heard, sort of sets the stage for winter. And it's Robert Frost's um, very famous Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sound is the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Well, <clears throat> this is such a classic. Um, I included it here because it discusses the snow, which is a characteristic of winter, at least in the northern hemisphere, and also suggests other qualities of winter, such as the woods are lovely, dark, and deep. So we'll turn to the works of some other poets to see what visions winter provides for them. And they're not all the same, as you might have guessed. I'm going to start with a poem by the most famous <clears throat> 18th century poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And this is called The Cross of Snow. In the long, sleepless watches of the night, a gentle face, the face of one long dead, looks at me from the wall where around its head the night lamp casts a halo of pale light. Here in this room she died, and a soul more white never through martyrdom of fire was led to its repose. Nor can in books be read the legend of a life more benedite. There is a mountain in the distant west that, sun-defying in its deep ravines, displays a cross of snow upon its side. Such is the cross I wore upon my breast these eighteen years, through all the changing scenes and season, changeless since the day she died. That's a sad uh, poem, as well it should be, because it bemoans the death of Longfellow's wife, who was gruesomely burned to death by a fire consuming her clothing, and which was lighted by a candle she was using to generate sealing wax. Uh, <clears throat> it's hard to imagine in our day that such a thing could happen, but it did. And it probably happened many times in early 19th century America. But let's move on <clears throat> to an early 20th century poet. <clears throat> Actually, he lived halfway. He lived until halfway through uh, the 20th century. His name was Wallace Stevens. Um, <clears throat> and here's his version of a winter poem. It's called the Snowman. 
One must have a mind of winter to regard the frost and the boughs of the pine trees crusted with snow and have been cold a long time to behold the juniper shagged with ice, the spruces rough in the distant glitter of the January sun, and not to think of any misery in the sound of the wind, in the sound of a few leaves, which is the sound of the land full of the same wind that is blowing in the same bare place for the listener who listens in the snow. And nothing himself beholds nothing that is not there, and the nothing that is. Well, <laughs> uh, this is a kind of nihilistic version of winter, don't you think? But it's beautifully written by one of the outstanding lyricists of the 20th century, <clears throat> Wallace Stevens. Um, I, I read some poetry by Wallace Stevens that was more lyrical a few months ago. <clears throat> and I like Wallace Stevens, um, even though he's not a Christian believer. And you can sort of tell it from this last poem. It's very nihilistic. Okay, now we deserve to have a more recent poem <clears throat> than these that we've had so far. And this is a poem by Robert Hayden. It's called Those Winter Sundays. Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold, then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather, made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Hayden describes how often his angry and austere father got up early on Sundays and warmed the house and polished his kids' shoes. He is telling us that there was something happening beyond the acts themselves that tell us more about his father than he could know or was willing to know at that time. Winter evokes a variety of responses in us, doesn't it? Christmas comes then, and for most Americans, releases a flood of emotions and good thoughts. But in the poetry of winter, we see other things as well. The poetry of winter that occurs before and after the poetry of Christmas. I thought about including Clement Moore's The Night Before Christmas in this parade of poems, but it was, in fact, the first poem that I ever had read to me uh, by another person, and the one that I first memorized. But while I read it, a great war was raging around the world, World War II, except in the safety of this great country. So, this is a glimpse of the complexities of our memories of winter. And perhaps we'll have more about Christmas at a later date. Thanks for listening. 
This is Jim Ransom with another episode of Morning Jim Poetry. Bye now.